afternoon. So um, I'm Daniel Banks. I've been asked to facilitate this um, with our uh, wonderful panelists and people who are bringing their, their knowledge and, and, and experience to the room. We thought being after lunch that we wouldn't necessarily have you sit right away because we know what happens after lunch when you sit down in a hot room. So uh, the idea was to have a little bit more like a kind of a gallery type uh, environment. Some folks have put things up on the wall about the initiatives that their organizations are doing. And um, maybe I'll just shout out the people now so you, you know who they are. Uh, we've got, um, please uh, make some noise, Ari Edelson from The Orchard Project. <laughs> and Christy Hamilton from IRTA, University of Western Association. And are you officially part of the session today, too, Tony? Tony, I'm yeah, not, he's always. Well, I'm not officially, but I am okay. the executive and director. And Tony Hagopian is the executive <laughs> director of IRTA, who's here to support. <laughs> uh, Jason Najum from the Yale Theater Management Knowledge Base. <laughs> and Lauren Ruffin Hi. over here from uh, Fractured Atlas. <laughs> So before we kind of settle down into our chairs and stuff, we've got a few minutes to walk around. You can meet them, say hi, look at what they've put on the wall. It'll give you a little bit of, um, you know, we all process information in different ways. So wanted to have some visual information as well as some auditory information. And um, uh, also please add your um, responses on these wall papers here. And then I've got something um, on the chairs for folks who don't want to lean over so what initiatives, programs would you like to see at your or a workplace so you can add uh, your voices and desires and experiences to that wall. And we'll do that for about five minutes and then we'll take our chairs. Mm -hmm. So please, um, please let the games begin. <laughs> <laughs> Take a minute to read what your colleagues are writing as well on the wall right away. 
short version of the panel uh, or the, 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 the session um, description is what uh, um, what initiatives or programs would uh, make it be a place that you want to work. So that's just so everyone knows where we are. We're in that session that had a, a very fun title, but um, which is also going to be critiqued as well in the session. <laughs> <laughs> um, fortunately, we have to question everything. Question everything. It's, it's good practice. But let's just begin, uh, if you'll indulge me, I, I don't know if um, folks who were in the session earlier today heard the speaker talk about um, neurobiology and the connection to the arts, and there's actually recent studies, surprise, surprise, because people have been doing it for thousands upon thousands <coughs> of years, but there are recent studies that conscious breathing actually leads to accessing parts of the brain that cannot be accessed any other way, and that when we access those parts of the brain, we can actually receive new information and learn new things, and it changes us. So if you are uh, willing, uh, if not, you can maybe think happy thoughts or something, <laughs> um, but if you would be uh, willing to uh, take um, things off your lap, 
and uncross your legs and put your feet on the ground. You feel where we are. And we've had wonderful acknowledgments so far in the conference about whose land we are actually on. And you can think about that as well, the indigenous peoples of this land who were driven out of here. It's a privilege to be here. And um, close your eyes or look at the floor or look at the ceiling and try to, as Thich Nhat Hanh would say, take some conscious breaths, which means being aware of every moment of every moment of every breath. <laughs> I also, uh, in my uh, responsibilities as facilitator, would just like to read presence the uh, agreements that um, TCG has been working with <coughs> for this conference. Um, and I ask that, that we assume, the first one is assume good intentions, and I just ask since we don't have time to necessarily discuss and process all the agreements that we assume good intentions with these agreements as well. Um, but I think it is always uh, nice to start uh, a session with just um, a reminder of how to navigate this many people with this many interests in one room. So these are the, the agreements that TCG has been using. Assume good intentions, listen for understanding, what's learned here leaves here, what's said here stays here, which means that if people want to say, um, confidential things in the room that they can say that with the knowledge that nobody's going to then re repeat it, and, you know, that it came from them. Um, allow everyone to speak for themselves, not on behalf of a group. Move up and move back, or as I like to say, wait, one. why am I <coughs> talking, why am I not talking? Um, and uh, no one knows everything, but together we know a lot that there is collective wisdom in the room and collective intelligence, and that, that actually helps move the dial in the things that we want to see change. So, thank you. Thanks for listening to that. Uh, in an ideal world, we would all go around and say our names and our gender pronouns and our access needs and um, where we're from, and then it would be time to go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I am going to ask you to uh, find a partner, and we're going to do one uh, brief uh, listening partnership. And maybe those are some things you'd like to share in the listening partnership with your partner, your name, where you're from, your gender pronouns, and access needs, which some folks aren't familiar with. But those are the kinds of things that we need to know about each other so that we can actually take care of each other. I've had people in those circumstances say, my empty pen's in my left pocket, or um, I'm hypoglycemic, so if I start eating, it's not me being rude, it's just me taken care of so I don't fall out. Um, so I think that's also a really uh, another addition to the list of ways that we, that we get to know each other. Um, so I'll see if we can just do it the easiest way possible, just people sitting next to each other. So we'll just do two, 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 maybe you and Joan. You two, you two, can we figure this out? Can you all sort of like now? <laughs>
conscious breathing worked? You learned something new? Okay. Yeah, access a part of your brain? Okay, great. Now we're gonna do that again and in a slightly different way. I'm gonna, in a second, I'm gonna ask you to choose an A and a B. And the, um, the A will be the person whose birthday comes first in the Roman calendar year. Okay, that's gonna take 10 seconds to do. So go, you have 10 seconds. Uh, okay, great, excellent. So um, Bs are gonna speak first. And uh, the way that this works is that it's a deep listening exercise, which means that Bs are gonna speak, and A, your only job is to listen to B. And since this is theater, I'm gonna give you in the manner of, you are going to beam your loving attention in the direction of your B. Right, so A, you're beaming your loving direction in the attention of your B. B, you're gonna speak on a topic that I'm about to uh, suggest. And then in about two minutes, I'm gonna ask you to switch. Switch does not mean find a <coughs> partner. Switch means that A's will speak, and you gotta be, uh, listen, we're a creative group. I found already this week that you really like, you know, <laughs> uh, that uh, A's will speak, and B's, you will do what? And B, your loving attention in the direction of your A's. Great, great. Uh, so the, the, the prompt that I'm gonna suggest that you speak on, and if you run out of things to say, you can just gaze. Lovingly, <laughs> you can repeat what you've already said, um, but stay with it. Stay with the and and again, uh, I'll just reiterate: uh, the listener. It's not the situation of somebody starts to talk about something at their work, and you're like, "Oh yeah, that happened to me too." The, your job is just to listen and be listen and be. Uh, so, bees, please speak about a situation at work where either you did not feel well supported by the infrastructure of your organization and you wish that you had been in a particular way or where you were exceptionally well supported and it's really innovative that your organization does that. So you can either talk about a challenge or you can talk about a success story uh, and I'll give you about two to two and a half minutes depending on how hot the room seems to be and then literally and metaphorically and then uh, I will say switch. Great, bees, please begin.
please finish up that thought. Please finish up that thought and switch. So no speaking clearly enough for the live stream. So I will speak louder. That's never been said before in my life. That I'm about it. But I'm not trying to blow you out of the room, so I'm just explaining why I'm talking more loudly. Um, can we just, uh, before we hear from the, uh, the invited speakers, I would love to hear a few share outs from you all of things that you discussed. I will say, please only share something that you share. And if it's something that you, your partner shared that you really, really, really want to share, um, maybe ask them if they could share it. Um, because again, given the confidentiality, we want to make sure that we respect that in the room as well as outside of the room. So uh, a couple quick shares, either a success or a challenge. Yes, yes please. Uh, and, and say your name. Hi, so my name is Michael Sag. I'm the managing director of WP Theater in New York. And one of the challenges that I think we faced is uh, we're a very small organization and up until two weeks ago there were only two full-time employees, the artistic director and myself, and when we were bouncing ideas off of each other it became very apparent that we were each firm in our opinions. Uh, and about two weeks ago we added two new staff members that have now broadened every one of our conversations so that we're actually having a dialogue about what, uh, about not just each person's set of opinions but really feeding back on what, what the other person is sharing with me and being able to share back with them my thought based on what they've said. And the dialogue has improved in such an amazing, uh, uh, in such an amazing way. I'm just very, I'm very grateful for this uh, change in our structure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Was there, were you raising your hand or were you? I'm, I'm okay, happy great. to share. Sure. Great, thanks. We had very similar 
success story, actually. Yeah, could you um, just say your name? Sure, sorry. I'm Jenny Lockett, managing director for Page 73 in Brooklyn. Um, I have a 17 month old, and I found out I was pregnant about five months into my <laughs> new job. And I was very nervous to tell people, and I wanted to keep the job and come back and all of that. And I found um, nothing but support and actually helped create a parental leave policy that is now just a policy for the company and was able to take a maternity leave and not, and be paid. And, um, it, you know, just like being the person who ha happened to get pregnant, you know, was, um, helped really implement this new um, policy in our company. and environment all around and it's just great. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll share because I was encouraged to share. Okay. Um, hey. <laughs> um, my name is Julaine Havens and I'm the Associate Artistic Director of Commonwealth Theatre Center in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and I was just sharing that um, at our, our theatre center, um, like most theaters, we're asked for evidence of what we do and why it's important and um, needing numbers on things that we don't really feel we want to put numbers on. Um, and I feel just very supported from um, both the leadership and artistic staff of our company who went with us and many trials and errors of figuring out how to make that work. And now five years later, we can say, here's the growth of the students in our program. Here's the impact of our plays in our community. Um, and that's been very fulfilling, uh, even though I've been, I had to do less acting and directing and those things that I love, so it's, it's been wonderful for us. Yeah, just went with us as a team. Yeah. One or two more. <laughs> Okay, one more. Over here. Uh, I have been encouraged by my by my partners to speak. Okay. Uh, I am a relatively new managing director and. Um, and what's your name, Jill Anderson, Syracuse Stage. And uh, after assessing the situation on the ground, we've elected to make a couple of staffing changes as, as generously as we can. But what we found is that uh, even in the leadership of the systems, we're not necessarily in place. To how, literally, how do we do that? Do we have an institutional uh, protocol for email, phones, cards, building access, all those things? Uh, and so we need to build some structure and support to make those conversations hard as they're going to be anyway, work better. Great. Even in the voluntary department. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. I think it's important um, personally in a room that the people who've been invited to speak are not the only sort of experts in the room, that there's a lot of expertise in the room. <coughs> I think it's also really good to start off a session like this knowing that there are things, good and positive things that are happening and it's not all an uphill battle and um, maybe also there are people who would like to accomplish something like what you did, uh, they know they can go to you and, and, and consult you about it or any of you who have spoken. So thank you for sharing. Um, so this is what the rest of our time is going to look like. Each of the, uh, the four invited speakers are going to give about a five minute uh, overview of their um, institution and work life and, and the things that they, the, the, the initiatives that they uh, have embarked on. Then there will be time to break out into small groups. Um, you can get with one of them. Oh, excuse me. You, uh, you can, um, we'll find, this, we'll figure out a way in this room to all get together and be heard. We might want to spill out into the, yeah, don't tell anyone. I don't think that's part of it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. Um, and, uh, uh, but also, I encourage if none of the the things that are being discussed are pertinent to your organization, or your organization's already accomplished all of those, feel free to have a breakout session with like-minded people that you find. Um, and uh, if you just want to shout out at some point, we'll, we'll give you an opportunity as we're breaking out. I want to have a conversation about whatever it is, fill in the blank. And then we can also have some, some breakout groups that are uh, self-defined. And then we'll come back, share back. We'll ask that each group uh, do a brief report of what was discussed in the group, and then we'll take another breath together and go on our merry way. So um, that's what our time is. Uh, Ari, would you like to begin? You yeah. have uh, five minutes to talk about your, and is it okay for the folks if I do this? Go for it. That's what I'm not being secret. <laughs> <laughs> this is a secret message. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to put a little timer in and create Ari what's going on at the Orchard Project.
Uh, so I'm not sure how many of you know uh, what the Orchard Project is, but we are uh, essentially one of the major development laboratories for new work in the country. Um, one of the things that's actually so wonderful about looking at these little ta tags is that I sort of see many of the places that work that started the Orchard Project has gone on to, um, and um, and uh, we're you know we're essentially a community of work, we're a community of artists. Uh, and uh, over the course of the last 10 or so years, we've developed 200 shows uh, that have pretty much gone up on almost every single stage in the United States, give or take. Um, and one of the things that's, you know, that happens is we're constantly trying to be form-fitting to the artists that come. We don't have a program per se. There's no capstone. There's no, you know, we want to meet artists where they are. And, uh, and in the second year of the Orchard Project, a playwright by the name of Renick Roth uh, came to work on a play that then became a play called Compulsion with the public, uh, and she just asked us randomly, uh, hey, can I bring my kid? And we didn't have an answer. I called the managing director at the time, and I said, what should we do? And he says, well, I, I guess we could just let her bring her kid. <laughs> and we didn't really think much about it. Uh, you know, we were, we were young, like we were just starting this thing out. We didn't really have rules to go by. Uh, but little did we know that as soon as she arrived, she let us know that none of the other play development laboratories in the country would <coughs> let her bring her child. Mm. It was actually against policy at that time in 2008 uh, for her to bring her child to a number of other sort of similar institutions in the country. Um, and so thus became sort of a golden rule, like treat every artist the way that you wish to be treated if you were the same as them. Uh, and, uh, and over the course of the next nine or so years, we probably hosted uh, well, basically, Great God Pan. If you did it, it's because there was a child at the Orchard Project. Compulsion, if you did it, it was because there was a child at the Orchard Project. Wholehearted, you did it because there was a child at the Orchard Project. We could sort of list the plays that the children were with us. And uh, they've become a huge part of our community. We realized that wasn't enough. And so last year, uh, at the urging of the playwright Robert Schenken, who's on our board, uh, we instigated a childcare initiative without any research whatsoever. <laughs> we said, it can't just sort of be one week. It can't be need-based. We just have to say, it's good business for us to make the Orchard Project entirely child-friendly. So if you come with a two-year-old and you want to bring a caretaker, we'll make that work. If you come <coughs> with a three-year-old and you want us to find care, we will make that work. Uh, if you come with a six-year-old and you would like us to kind of find an external program, we will make that work. And we basically did that last year. Uh, we raised the money for it actually fairly quickly. Uh, we did a huge amount of research and we realized no one else had data on this. There's very little pan, you know, industry data about child, child, like, child, like children and families. <laughs> And the best we could find is we actually reached out to some economists at Cornell who were doing research on the effect of childcare in America workforce in general. And their, their research is actually shocking because they believe, and they sort of statistically prove it, and there's very small graphs here <laughs> uh, if you want to see their, st their stats, is that if you eliminate all of the other factors, the Workforce participation by women is most highly correlated to childcare. Mm -hmm. It is not correlated to leadership nearly as much as childcare. It is not correlated to middle management nearly as much as it is to childcare. And not just childcare as far as presenting paid leave, but an entire ecosystem of taking care of people with families. And of course, we exist in a world in which there are many different versions of what that parent may be. Right? And so it's not necessarily one definition of a family that we have to consider. There's many definitions of a family that we have to consider. And so if we're collectively invested in the idea of the representation of the most diverse group of voices as possible, and the most diverse stories as possible, um, then addressing this issue is actually a very important one. Um, we've learned some lessons. We're really excited about learning more as we continue doing it. It's not that hard. We learned that that kind of sort of has a peak cost per child per week of around X amount. And then after so many, so many families, it actually has an economy of scale. Um, 
most of the problems that people say are really problems that we would have encountered, like state licensing or insurance are generally faux you know, excuses for not addressing this issue. And, um, and, you know, and we're kind of really excited to learn alongside other institutions that want to address this collectively. Because I think, just to sort of finish, I can easily foresee a day in a few years from now where there will be the institutions that address this and those that don't. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be on this side of the aisle when you're speaking to artists, you may have to start figuring this out because the artists are talking about it and they will choose the institutions that are addressing it. So it's, you know, I, I don't mean to be so mercenary, <laughs> but, it's, but it's kind of mercenary. It's, like it's, it's, I think it's a big deal. And I think it's actually not just human, but it's actually really important to the businesses that we all collectively run. Second. Sure. So, Lauren <coughs> from Fractured Atlas. Okay, Hi, Lauren. Um, thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, that's my lovely um, sheet over there with uh, sort of how I've sketched out these five minutes. Um, you can say I'm a classically trained fine artist. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Uh, so, Fractured Atlas, for those of you who don't know, is um, is the largest association of artists in the country. We're also the largest fiscal sponsor. Um, we sponsor anywhere between 4,000 and 5,000 projects across all the disciplines a year. Um, we also have a liability insurance program. We offer visa letters for artists who, you know, back when people wanted to come into our country uh, to perform. Um, that was really gangbusters until recently. Um, what else? We also offer a ticketing platform in CRM called Artfully. So those are our products. Oh, it's Space Finder. In some cities that you might be in, you have a Space Finder, which allows you to find creative spaces. Um, I oversee our policy, marketing, uh, communications, and uh, fundraising function. Um, we're about a $28 million a year organization, about a $5 million operating budget. Um, and there are some things about how we're structured that makes some of the things I'm going to talk about <coughs> little, um, probably harder to implement in your organization, but I figured I'd throw it out there for conversation anyway. Um, so hopefully we can all agree on this. Uh, work shouldn't suck. Um, that is our core model, and we're sort of um, we're structuring programs for our employees. Um, we like coming to work. We try to create an environment where folks can be creative. Um, the majority of our staff are working artists. I think I'm the only person who's not a working artist and has never worked as an artist in our organization. Everyone else is, you know, either a musician. We have a bunch of performing artists. Um, so. And we, we, a lot of our policies sort of came about because we had staff who wanted to um, have a full-time sustainable job, but also were producing plays and producing work throughout the year and needed some time to be able to sort of explore their creative side. And we recognized that having working artists made it easier for our, um, our staff to be able to connect with the folks that we serve. Um, so work shouldn't suck. Um, the, the other thing that we've made pretty clear is that uh, we're a pretty employee first organization. Um, we really lean into yes, um, similar to what Ari was saying earlier. So. Um, we currently have an unlimited vacation policy. Um, all of the, um, which sounds crazy as hell, right? Um, I was like, really unlimited when I started? Really? Like, actually unlimited? Um, but yeah, and all the research suggests that when you give people unlimited vacation, they actually use less of it. Um, if you tell people they have four weeks off a year, they take four weeks. Um, the, our average staff member takes about a week of just pure vacation time. The majority of staff have <coughs> time off to be producing plays, so they're just working in another capacity. Um, we also have, in terms of um, how we hire, um, we've undergone a major shift in our hiring process as a result of sort of number three, our, our, AO, our ARAO policy, anti-racism, um, anti-oppression, work that we've done over the last couple of years. Um, our hiring process has, um, number one, uh, because of some of the statements we've made, which I'll talk about later, um, we now get up to, um, I currently have a position open, a, open that one is open two years ago when I started, we got about 50 applications for. I looked this morning, I've got 300 applications for it. Um, which is a nightmare in some ways. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we've been able to really attract um, a, different, a different type of candidate and uh, folks really want to come work with us because of we've been so sort of vocal about our belief system. Um, as part of the hiring process, we now ask people to talk about their belief system with regard to sort of our, all of our basic humanity. Um, and they are sort of understanding what diversity looks like, how they're interacting in the workplace with colleagues who may have different backgrounds than they do. Um, and so we now hire people who already have the cultural um, belief system that we want our organization to have. 
as opposed to believing that we have to immediately start from scratch and train everyone from scratch. We recognize there's knowledge that's inherent in a lot of the conversations that we're having that's just out there and people have it. Um, we start our employees at, I believe, $46,000 or $48,000 a year. That's our entry level base. Um, we have four tiers. Um, everybody within the same tier, oh, it's, okay, everyone within the same tier um, makes the same thing. Um, at, a, at a leadership level, we have um, just a fair amount of back and forth. I, I think there should be an opportunity for um, really great staff members to be able to get an increase in their salary. Um, and we're currently working to roll out some stuff around that, but that was essentially an equity thing that was implemented prior to my starting. Um, our ARA policies, we've done a lot of work in this area that I, um, I think some of you probably heard me talk about yesterday at the managing director's lunch. Um, but we've done everything from, um, and this was really spurred by employees who did not feel safe in our workspace. Um, we had a number of employees who were having really difficult interactions with their colleagues, um, and really difficult interactions with our customer base. And so, and felt like management was not really hearing their concerns. Um, and so we've done everything from, we've changed our call script um, for, our, for our customer service team, um, all the way up to having sort of a grievance um, report of the <coughs> form for folks outside, inside and out of the organization. Um, our ecosystem to just sort of report things that might be that might make people uncomfortable, um, and I won't talk about killing zombies. I'll just let you guys ask me about that. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds really interesting. You take it out, you can, I mean, it's a loose I thing. You okay. Um, so uh, the zombie thing is, I think in every organization we have things that have always been done. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, I think we have a culture of like killing them pretty quickly. Um, so if there's a program that doesn't work, if there's a policy that stops working. Um, we don't hold on to it because we have a board member or that's how it's always been. An example of that is um, we're currently in the process of anyone who's, if anyone here has been fiscally sponsored by Fractured Atlas, um, we have a thousand dollar threshold. Um, that story has been told about why there's a thousand dollar threshold before you can apply for a grant from a foundation. Um, I've heard everything from um, the foundation told us it had to be that way, it's part of the fiscal sponsorship rules. The reality is it's a huge barrier for folks who don't have anyone who can just write a thousand dollar check. Um, and we're really being cautious of really wanting to bring in people of color and folks from rural communities and people who just don't have access to wealth like that. Um, it, was a, it was an unfair barrier. Um, it turns out that, that was just something that our founder did back in 2007 when we first started it because we were getting crappy grant proposals and he didn't feel like having to tell people their grants were shit. Um, <laughs> so it's like we had to kill that zombie quickly. Um, and we asked questions about things like that all the time. Um, and so that's just talking about how do we, how, what do we hold on to for reasons that probably happened a long time ago. Um, so yeah. <laughs>the Residence Theater Association has an umbrella program and it's now two years, three years old, uh, when Ari, Liz, and I all met in Washington DC at TCG's conference there. We had said to Ari, there has to be something that we can create that will help not only small producing companies but large producing companies <coughs> offer really comprehensive competitive benefits. Because I think something that our industry uh, lacks or could do a little better is offering you know, employee retention benefits. So this pension program is an effort, is a start in order to do that. I think first what I'll say is uh, IRDA is really known for our recruitment. Um, it's our flagship program, but we do so much more than just recruitment. We do a lot of ancillary vital services to running your business. So we do payroll and we do pension and we do resource sharing and we do career development and we do it across the country. So we have a large, and Michael Fag, right? You were an intern at IRDA. Yeah. 1998. There. <laughs> so um, we have a very deep alumni pool. <laughs> so uh, the, the program itself is an effort to help you retain your employees in a better way. And I think that's why Liz here is our initial uh, company that joins the umbrella with Cutting Ball. Yes, it was our pilot. Yes, yes. So um, we've had uh, some success with it and we'd like to continue to build that because uh, at IRTA we believe that the profession, the pathway to profession is through quality training, but also through legitimate professionalized business strategies. And that's something that, you know, in a lot of our programming through like Urticare, helping actors get their health weeks, this pension program, a uh, program that we are devising right now called Partner Modeling, which takes a university and a local producing company and helps them connect to share resources. Because I think just like Fracture Atlas, we're all in the same game, we're just at different levels. 
And I think a misconception is, is that universities have all of this money. There's just ridiculous amounts of money at the university level, but I can't tell you one member that has ever told me, no, 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 I have too much money. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so what we try to do throughout like our national <coughs> network is to say, we have resources in all of these different ways from training to producing. And what we'd really like to do is help artists move through that pathway. So that way you can have a very full life and a very full career in the arts. And I think that's what our mission is. I know I'm very short on that. I think that was, <laughs> that's my pitch. That was um, yeah, that was two and a half minutes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Great. So how does that umbrella Oh, thank work. you, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank God you're here. Um, so our <laughs> umbrella is uh, basically why it was started was that um, Erda has a, a standing pension program through TIA because um, we're a, a mainly an earned service program or a company. So when we had talked to Liz and Liz was at Tectonic at the time, she didn't have the assets to be able to go to these pension programs and say, I'd like to offer this to my employees. So in the beginning of it, what we had approached Ari with um, so it's really Ari's kind of labor of love for all of us, uh, is saying, well, Erda has all of these assets, how do I better leverage my assets as a company so that smaller companies can then also like join and have a pension program? So a large part of that pension program is the fact that it's a collective, that what we'd like to do is have other companies join the collective because as that collective grows, we can use it for, I mean, an unlimited amount of things that we can negotiate for, workman's comp, health insurance, all of these things that I think as an industry of very small producing theater companies, we lack. We, and I think this is a thing I've heard, I don't know if anybody else has heard this, but across this conference is like, there is no resource, there's no like centralized data, like where do I go and who do I talk to about like implementing these programs? And I think that's why, I think we'll see more of these, hopefully. But our pension program is a collective in a way to bring all of us, small to large, from you know the individual artists to the university producing repertory theater or our partner theaters, that they can all come together and then we can work as an industry to get better rates, better health insurance. Oh my God, I made it to a minute. So, um, so I think, so Ari is here uh, as an effort because he is our financial advisor and he can talk all about basis points and he can talk all about like, <laughs> how it actually works as a fiduciary like, compliant organization and he can absolutely answer all of those questions. And I can talk about what it's like to actually do it. Exactly. It's who's, not hard. It's not. Who's eligible to use the Urda umbrella? Everybody. Right? No university. No. In fact, it's mostly not universities because yeah. universities have actually usually university. have their own. Yeah. So it's yeah. it's places like Cutting Ball or Tectonic, small theater companies that have enough regular employees that, or maybe just a few regular employees that they'd like to be able to offer that, but they're too small on their own. Because I think this is the other thing that I'll say is that as we legitimize our business practices and we offer comprehensive and competitive benefits. I think we as administrators are the best spokesperson for this industry when it comes to responsiveness, when it comes to change for our industry. And I don't think it's funders and I don't think it's CEOs on our boards that all run Fortune 500 companies or whatever. I think it's us. So in order to retain us from other sectors that hire our similar skill sets, we need to be able to offer our employees something that keeps us here. And we need to be able to retire eventually. Yeah. 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 And you can't do that if there's no benefits in place. Mm -hmm. Right, keep the train going. That's yes. it. Exactly. Great. Great. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Jason Najum from the Yale Theater Management Knowledge Base. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. So, so great to see so many people. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about the Yale Theater Management Knowledge Base. Uh, I'm the, I've been the managing editor there. This is like my last formal engagement in that role. So uh, if you're interested in the knowledge base, I have information I can give you about that and my successor. But um, the Yale Theater Management Knowledge Base was created 10 years ago, and uh, it is a repository of theater management knowledge uh, and <laughs> management tools uh, for use by educators and students and also theater practitioners. Um, uh, one of our biggest uh, groups of uh, materials are case studies, but we also have sample contracts and things like that. Um, and so this project came out of me being in that role and also um, 
this program is nestled under the theater management department at the Yale School of Drama, which for uh, those of you who don't know, it's sort of like a, it's a very close partnership with Yale Repertory Theater, so we're both an educational environment and workplace at the same time. So that uh, situation sort of made this be a great laboratory for trying to experiment with a different way of thinking about evaluation, uh, performance management, feedback, and ultimately end-to-end -end professional development within a work setting. So when we set out to sort of redesign the way that we did this for students, we figured out and heard feedback really early on that actually this was totally applicable to uh, employees in any workplace. Um, so we, you know, we did have a system before. Um, so we did, the process was that we surveyed all the people who had participated in the system before, um, higher parts of the hierarchy, lower parts, lateral people that sort of outside the system that also would participate in like 360 reviews to see how, what their experience with the system was like. Uh, and then me, and I did this with a colleague, Gretchen Wright, who had graduated the year before and worked uh, at the time for uh, an organizational performance uh, consulting firm. Uh, we surveyed and did a meta-analysis of what uh, is out there when it comes to performance management uh, theory and practices. Um, you know, yes, what had been created 50 years ago that has given us this annual review concept, but also what books were released last year. Um, and then also, because all of this was done through the lens of uh, trying to make the work at the school and the rep more inclusive, um, how can we apply critical race theory? How can we apply restorative justice? Things like that to make this a better system. So we surveyed the field, and then we created a new design, shared it with, uh, with the stakeholders, um, got feedback, and then ultimately we created an implementation plan. So over the next three years, the department is going to roll this out. Uh, so that's a sort of a summary of like kind of how we did it, what it is, some fundamental theory behind it. Um, first off, uh, trying to reorient this process to being employee focused, like others have said, as opposed to organization focused. The idea that if this, your people are growing, the organization will grow. Um, and I think the other really important thing is that um, and this is based on uh, work that was written about, I can't think of the author's name, but the book is covering. Uh, Catherine Schultz is Being Wrong is another book that talks about this, where most people spend most of their time and energy trying to pretend like they're perfect. Um, and that's a lot of wasted energy, because actually what helps people grow is making mistakes often um, and then learning from them. And so, Literally, like what we do usually is exactly the opposite of what we should be doing to both grow ourselves and grow the organization. So uh, uh, this turned out to be uh, calling for a culture change in the in the department about how open and transparent we tra transparent we would be about uh, what we're struggling with, what we want to to learn, and how we want to grow, and how we can do that within our roles, and then ultimately uh, support people leaving. Uh, if they want to. So this idea of, of uh, we sort of think of it like a, like a loop, like you're going along and then you make a mistake and you sort of figure out why did I make that mistake, like kind of diagnose to root cause, design a new either development solution or like, oh, actually I'm never gonna be good at that thing, so I need to actually pull this colleague in to help me because that's a weakness I don't wanna work on. And then you sort of catapult yourself up into the next level. Otherwise, you're sort of just flatlining. It requires the spin to get yourself up into the right when it thinks about when you think about like fulfilling your potential, right? Um, so then we thought, well, how do we uh, systematize that uh, within uh, like an employee life cycle? So actually, using the framework of a student coming into a three-year program actually maps really well onto uh, hiring and onboarding through the life cycle of an employee towards eventually all of your employees are going to leave the company. So, and that should be like encouraged when it's time, right? And so we sort of mapped a three-year plan for how one would come to the organization, learn the systems at the organization, uh, collect data longitudinally about what they're like, make some sort of uh, synthesis around that, decide what they're gonna do about that based on their job, and then ultimately uh, prepare to leave. Thank you to all four of you <coughs> with an assist from Tony. Uh, um, 
we have, here are the options, and then I'll ask if anyone wants to put another option on the table. We have um, Ari and uh, the Child Care Initiative that he described. We have Lauren and the Employee First uh, various programs that were described at Fractured Atlas. We have Christy and the Umbrella Policy, uh, which really focuses on employee retention, if I said that correctly. Um, and then uh, Jason, which a whole lot of things, including how to use the database, but or the, the knowledge base, but what I took away from that was also that you're really thinking about culture changes um, within an or create how to, how to create culture shifts within an organization so that you can actually create change in that organization. And also it seems to me about, like you said, the life cycle of the employee. Um, so are there any other um, burning questions, desires, in terms of improving uh, work-life balance, uh, um, employee culture, programs that are offered um, at institutions that you would like to also hold a, a breakout session for? Is everybody happy to go to one of these four? Yes, please. Will your group cover succession and like when people need to go? Like, I think part of it is like people don't leave. How do we address like people knowing when to gracefully move on? <laughs> <laughs> that's part of, I think, I like how to create a culture where that's not a bad thing. Correct. And that's part of it. Right. Okay. Because right. I think succession in our field right now is a huge topic. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Cool. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I'm good. <laughs> yes, I'm not actually proposing another one, and if this doesn't work, then it doesn't work. Is there any possibility we could, like, make them a little shorter and do, the idea of having to select which of these breakouts I'm going to go to is, like, horrible, because I want to have conversations about all four, but I could at least narrow it to two if I had the opportunity. Sure, I mean, Just to um, throw up. well, let's... There's, there's another option, which is that we don't do breakouts. Um, so uh, we can just do a show of hands. This is uh, called adaptable leadership. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my favorite new term that I learned this weekend. Um, so uh, who, how many folks would like to, I, I think my, my short answer to your question is, um, the open space technology says that follow your feet. So my short answer would be, visit, you know, Bumblebee. Okay. But we could also rethink and just have a big open conversation. So how many people would like to break out into breakout sessions? Uh, one, two, three. Does that mean that everybody else is, wants to stay in a big group? Everyone, can, how many people want to stay in a big group? Okay, the group has it. Um, so maybe the, maybe, maybe we can just do some Q&A now, some follow-up Q&A, does that sound? Sure. What would be useful? I mean, this is about you. This is what's going to be useful for you. So, um, is there something else you would like to do? <laughs> okay, great. Q and A. It's open for Q and A. Yes, please. Okay. So, for all of the panelists and probably everyone's room, I'm relatively new in the management side of the arts and performance <coughs> uh, master's degree, but I'm the managing director of a children's theater, um, very large organization. We have satellite theaters around North Texas. Um, my we're run by a governing board of trustees, and we have a business manager who is right out of corporate America. Every efficiency that comes out of corporate America is her world. That's not our world as artists. We have to juggle between that. If a, a time sheet is not turned in on time, they don't get paid for a month. But sometimes a time sheet's not on time because they got more applause for their show, and it didn't end on time for them to get the paperwork. And navigating the world of the artistic personality and the spontaneity, the, the unique schedules that we bring against the world of a business that you have to have tax deadlines, you have to have contracts. I'm struggling with that because I want my artists to thrive as artists and I see where they're coming from and then I'm met with these awkward deadlines and these awkward policies. Um, if you didn't do your requisition form and triplicate, you're not going to get your pens to write on your desk. Like, can anyone speak to that? Am I the only one that issue? <laughs> so does anyone have any suggestions for Michael about how to navigate this tricky balance? I mean, have you talked to your business manager about it? <laughs> I mean, that would be my first. Yes, question. I actually um, gave her the book, The Rise of the Creative Class. Oh, okay. Um, she rejected it wholeheartedly, and oh. the Board of Trustees supports her. Oh, that's Ooh. tough. They want the fiscal management like we're a corporation. They want us to be more corporate. And I, I do understand that. I of course, of course. It's just it's the communication between the two that I'm tasked with. Can you hire important. an associate underneath her to act as an, it's like an intermediary? It's not my place in the organization. I think. Uh, yes, please. Uh, uh, Tim Shields from the Globe in, in San Diego, you might look for a peer in a larger performing arts organization who could act as a counselor mm -hmm. to the, it, who they would look up to because it's a bigger organization mm -hmm. and knows how the arts really work. 
and say, why don't we arrange a meeting and just a breakfast and get together and share sort of thoughts and build an ongoing relationship there about what's normative in our world as opposed to what's normative over in the corporate world. I, I, just to second that, we have a similar sort of problem um, with uh, we our paymaster uh, program services uh, a lot of university theaters, um, and and those universities um, are are very often not regularly hiring um, guest artists. It's a new kind of thing, and it's usually being handled not by one of the artistic schools, but by the procurement office or the business office. So um, sometimes they'll get contracts or or language and stuff that they say, well. We, we can't do this, whether it's in something in an equity contract or USA contract. And um, exactly what you're talking about is we find other examples uh, of the, uh, from other universities that we've worked with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've, we had a university um, tell uh, a, a university theater that they had to pay the actors an hourly minimum wage to learn their lines outside of rehearsal because that's what the law mm -hmm. said. That, because this was a lawyer unfamiliar with anything to do with theater and reading and church. so we found another university in that state system just a different campus that we had worked with a lot and got their lawyers to say no 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 and here's why and and they listened to that because they're speaking the same language mm -hmm. um, so it's very similar to what you're saying. another another resource I don't know if there's like a VLAA volunteer lawyers in the for the arts or something in your area um, but uh, like we have an accountant that has worked in various spaces with us over years, but has worked with a lot of uh, varying size nonprofit theaters mm -hmm. and organizations. And uh, at this point, I basically keep her for like high level ana analytical stuff as a sounding board. Mm -hmm. So I almost never see her on a regular basis in my office. She's you know very minimal hours uh, a year, but she's very valuable, especially when I have new board people coming in to come in and help explain like. This is from a, a very experienced accountant who's been in the spaces for many, many years. This is how this works. This is the challenges. This is not rocket science. This is not, you know, and just kind of walk through the, that wonderful sort of even keeled accountant way. Um, mm -hmm. And that's been really, really helpful sometimes. Thank you. Um, um, I just want to say, a few, uh, I, I want to generalize this because I don't want to isolate on this individual who could be watching this. Um, <laughs> 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 So I, I have a, I guess, a little bit of an oppositional perspective to this because everything I'm hearing is sort of like um, ways to work around this person. But it seems like uh, if the board wants something, but the management wants something else, and there's, you're not able to have these conversations, and that person's not budging, like there's some major underbelly culture mm -hmm. issues mm -hmm. that I'm hearing, I, and I can't like diagnose them. Yeah. But like I'm just saying that like uh, they're ultimately it would be much more high functioning if you just like actually solve the problem, which was either 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 work on like th that person's understanding of the process and like why did that person even want to work at this organization and like all that, or like decide that that's not a good fit. So I would say that generally speaking, For like sure. these issues, you that's should just <coughs> tackle them head on as opposed to trying to find ways around For them. Sure. So. so Chris and then Adam. I was going to move to a different topic, but oh, I can wait yeah. until I, I, was, I was going to oh. say like just one more thing generally is like, do people drink, do you drink with your colleagues? <laughs> <laughs> like so many of these, um, uh, people get caught up in their silos because people are control freaks. Mm -hmm. And this, I'm, I'm learning in this industry, there are a lot of things that I hear that <laughs> really is a, the, the, the product of a person's personality and their own shit working itself out in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And I can't say, I work with people who are, I am like completely different. I am the most chilled back, like chilled, legally trained person you will ever meet. <laughs> and there's shit that I get like, no, this has to be this way. And there's shit where I'm like, you know what, we need to go out and have a drink. We need to have <laughs> lunch together, we need to spend time getting to know each other and build some trust. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've had a number of conversations this weekend where like what we're really talking about, the underlying problems that you have a colleague that you, you have no working relationship with mm -hmm. and that you guys don't trust each other yet. Mm -hmm. So what you're really trying to do is like be friends with somebody so you can say, yo, can you chill out and try it this way for like two weeks? Like can we just give you a break for two weeks and if it works then let's keep it going. But you haven't built that relationship with mm -hmm. that person yet. And the converse too, I would say. Exactly. That sometimes those systems like, I'm, I'm the same, but I have a colleague who is so systematic and when I then turn over and go, oh, fine, fine, I'll do it. I'm like, oh, actually, I should do it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's a two-way street in that sense. Good, good. Let's, yeah. let's, 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 thank you very much for starting us off. Let's shift gears, Chris. Uh, I wanted to just, and you alluded to it, but I think all the groups kind of uh, talk a little bit about compensation, retention, equity. 
and you were you started where you were working under one system you're talking about evolving so I wanted to hear just what was working what wasn't directions that you're thinking of and if there's other thoughts around compensation as it relates to all of those issues yeah I mean I um, I've always worked in organizations where people were um, that were people were you know bonus at the end of the year based on their um, based on their productivity and their successes throughout the year um, it's also an interesting signaling tool um, if you've got if you've gotten a ten or fifteen thousand dollar bonus and your colleague knows that you've gotten that and they've only gotten a two thousand dollar bonus then they know it's time to make some different employment choices um, so Fraction Atlas has a flat tier structure. Um, and my problem with that, and it was done for equity reasons. Um, we've all read wage gap stuff, and we're aware that people are kind of not paid fairly based on whether they choose to negotiate or their perceived value within the organization. Um, so everyone at a, at a level has the same title. You know, we have an associate, a specialist, and then we now have an associate director um, and director roles. Um, so, uh, my problem with that is, you know, in the last two years, we've made some, um, we've exited some employees. Um, that it took a long time for us to get where we exited them, but for that, you know, six eight month period, this person who's very low performing is making the same thing mm -hmm. as all of their high performing colleagues at the same level. Um, so we're literally going to fire people who are making the same thing as the high performers, and the high performers know it, mm -hmm. and that kills morale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what we the system that we're likely going to move to is a system whereby we have steps um, within each tier, mm -hmm. um, and we're training staff because I also think that you know a fractured atlas is a place where yeah you come in everyone's getting the same thing and that's great. You leave here you're going to have to learn to negotiate for your salary your salary and justify your value. Mm -hmm. um, and so I also felt like especially since we hire disproportionately young people, mm -hmm. um, it's their first job. Um, negotiating your salary and being able to justify your value in an organization is an important skill. Um, so we're giving them negotiated training. Um, around sort of, um, we have OKRs and everything's tagged to OKRs, um, which are goals, um, objective key results. Um, and they have to look back over those, the OKRs they've had each quarter for the last year, um, annually, and say, I've done these things. Mm -hmm. um, and these things brought in X revenue or X members or you know this particular policy change or this work. Um, and as a, as a, uh, as a result, I'm, I, this is the reason why I need to move up to the next year. I deserve to move up to the next year. Um, and that's gonna be a big change for our organization. So my question, I think, is just for Jason. I feel like you were describing how you got to the tools that you developed, but we didn't quite get to hear what the tools are. And also, I was wondering <coughs> sort of how proprietary these tools are. Are they? Is this a shareable model? The specific tools you've developed. Uh, to answer the second thing first, I mean, what we did was we synthesized things that were out there and made sense of it for our environment. Um, but little what we did was like copyrightable, so please enjoy. Uh, uh, give credit if that's worth it to you. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I, but I think the trickier thing than just like taking pictures of this and like do, is actually like doing it for your organization, which requires uh, a certain level of uh, attention and expertise, I think. Um, in terms of the actual tools themselves, um, uh, so, it's easier, I think, to describe this based on the parts of the, the process. So the first part of the process is awareness, um, which is sort of, you could call it onboard, part of the onboarding, et cetera. And this is about um, the culture and the system, not necessarily about a person's job, although you could have that be part of this too if you have necessary training for the particular role. And so this is about, um, and I, this, I think works in a school context in particular, but I, I think actually it would work well in any context, is there's actually like shared vocabulary, just like we do with EDI, that needs to be had about like, what do these things mean and what uh, are the values of this organization when it comes to this work? So for example, there's a, a book called um, Mindset by Carol Dwig. Mm -hmm. um, and so trying to transition people from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset, for the system to work, everyone has to be on the same page about being oriented that way. Um, and so actually having people read some chapters from that. Uh, we actually, for this project, created a syllabus of uh, 12 workshops that people would do over the life cycle of them at the company. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's like three around the first part. 
the first part being you know getting the mindset right around what they're you know here to do the second is actually about giving and receiving feedback mm -hmm. something that people I think just uh, I've heard people just think expect that you know like you learn someday but actually like Kindergarten didn't teach you that very well. Um, they did teach you about sharing, but then not about how to talk about when the person didn't share very well with you. Um, and so there's actually a really great book called Thanks for the Feedback um, that became our has become our Bible around this. Um, so a little bit about that. There are actually three different types of feedback. Uh, this is one model. Uh, there's three different types, uh, appreciation, coaching, and evaluation. And most systems uh, across all industries try to do all those three things in one. Mm -hmm. um, but that gets very confusing, and they do it only once a year, mm -hmm. right? right. Um, and so actually breaking down that sometimes mm -hmm. it's just about appreciation, sometimes it's just about coaching without like a sense of like you're not doing this well enough. And then sometimes like maybe on an annual basis, you do need to make decisions about promotion, raises, exit, etc. And so, but it's really important for the giver and the receiver to be on the same page about what kinds of feedback they're wanting to receive in that moment and what they're not. And oftentimes, the tensions come when those things get confused. And actually, you only need evaluation very little bit of the time. But most of the time, you need coaching, mm -hmm. you know, which is much more of a friendly relationship between supervisor and employee, or even laterally, than it is about, like, you're not doing this well enough, right? Mm -hmm. So th th those are some of the ways. But you, the, I call it training, because you, you need to all be on the same page of what these words mean. Uh, and the last piece, actually, which is a, the part of the project that we're going through right now, is actually establishing for each role and for the organization, like what are the core competencies, and being able to like have shared vocabulary around that, mm -hmm. so that when you want to give feedback to someone and you say, um, you know, uh, I need you to be, uh, be pay more attention to time management or something, do they actually know what you mean by that? Mm -hmm. And like, do they are they hearing it the way you're giving it? Make we make a lot of assumptions, and it's received knowledge. This is actually also where white supremacist culture comes in. Um, you know, but not everyone actually agrees with that. Or so you have to like, and, and this is actually where it's customizable to the organization, right? What does this group of people want to do when it comes to their values and the culture that they want to have? So that's just like the first part of it. Then there's, you know, then I mean I could go through it, but those are some of the, like that's a deep dive into one particular part of it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so Thank you. you've been waiting for a while, and then um, also I think you did you have your hand up before? You so interested? Okay. Sorry. There's also someone over there. I don't want to jump in the way. Uh, um, so I, uh, I'm, I've recently taken over as the executive director of the Ensemble Studio Theater. Um, I'm very happy to be there. And uh, and I and it is an organization like many arts organizations where I've worked that has no um, no formal review structure at all. Um, I've worked. So many places. I mean, I'm sure this is true in a lot of industries, but I mean, certainly everywhere I've worked, it's a huge struggle, um, and uh, and it's something that I really believe in. Um, but I want to approach really mindfully, and uh, and I'm in, I, I was really interested to hear these sort of resources. And I'm wondering if you, if anyone here, or any of the uh, panelists, had any resources or thoughts on a creating and instituting that sort of procedure, and b any tips on how it's gone well or badly? I would say we recently, um, I'm from Victory Gardens Theater, we recently shift, shifted to twice a year reviews. The first is before the budget is approved so that right. you can make your case for a raise mm -hmm. and that that's the time that you uh, talk about your value and negotiate where you are and then halfway through the year we check back on our goals and that's the coaching portion mm -hmm. um, and that seems to work really well. We've got a lot of young staff and we've gotten um, we flipped almost all of our staff in the past year, so it's been a bit easier to implement um, because we, we got new, new new kids on the bus. Um, but it seems like the separation and just telling everybody in the month of July you need to meet with your supervisor and then whoever at the top tier um, is holding supervisors and department heads accountable. It's been um, not very, very difficult for us to implement, but the separating it is what has been really useful to us. I, I should also just say, um, one, this is not something I normally talk about. Um, my colleague Tim can be here for some family reasons. Um, our website has all of Tim's work. Um, we have a section called How We Work. Um, everything from all of our policies um, to how we hire, 
how we evaluate staff. Um, he's worked on a manual that, that talks exactly about what you were asking. Um, we've worked with our organizations to implement um, starting evaluations. Um, we do crucial conversations trainings. Um, and we're in the process of actually with a menu of sliding scale services. Um, but it's all Tim's work. Um, I'm like just the, the worst stand-in ever for him. Oh. Um, <laughs> So a lot of what you're saying, I think, um, if you checked out our website, and I'm happy to connect you with Tim, I just didn't want to leave without that getting through. Because he's the dude. I know Tim. I used to work for Fraction Atlas. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> so call, call Tim. Let yeah, Tim's, yeah he's, he's got you. Okay, thank you. Yes, please. Um, I'm just looking at this on this wall. It says paid family leave. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just curious. It's sort of twofold questions. One, we know that the money is an issue and paying people when they're not there and it's sometimes for a very small organization just like not possible at all. So I'm curious if there's any, if people who have some sort of paid maternity leave that isn't just like we pay you your full salary for three months, which I don't know, I don't know, personally know of arts organizations that are able to do that. So like are there sort of interim things that people have at their organizations and two, actually made this three goal, two, if you did institute that policy, how did you get there? How did you carve that out? And third, if your organization doesn't have that and you'd like to advocate for that, and you are one of those people that makes those decisions, what would be um, persuasive for you to, to make those changes? Sorry, three questions. <laughs> <laughs> I just did that. So I just underwent this process within my organization uh, with our board. And we have the starting uh, benefit of the California requires, California disability pays six weeks disability uh, and 60% of your salary. So we, we had that as a starting Illinois base. does not have that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it is for, um, it is for any, any, but any parents. That's for parenting. A new it's a, any parent. father could get disability? A new father could also get disability. Uh, and that is, that is through the state, but we felt that that was not enough because no one in our staff is getting paid enough to be able to still live on that. Uh, and it was, we, my artistic director and I had, were on very different places. I wanted to operate from a place of generosity because I, the staff retention issue is a bigger thing for me having to be the one replacing people. And she was worried about who's gonna do everyone's work yeah. while mm -hmm. they're gone. Uh, and the play, uh, we ended up presenting it to the board, but what we what we came up with was we, our organization is willing to pay the additional 40% for the six weeks so that, that we have some room to pay people. And we have a fairly generous sick and vacation leave. So someone could be gone paid for up to 12 weeks if they use all of their leave at, at a time, but it took a lot of internal debating about what's important, what's what's worth doing. But I've also worked at other organizations where uh, we just did each other's work, and it was uh, like a, I was in an organization where our ED was out for uh, 14 weeks, at dur leading up to a fundraiser. <laughs> but we we just had an agreement that it's like everyone's going to pitch in and cover it because you know one day it's going to be you. But you have to have your entire staff be on board with that as a model and uh, it, like really talking about your staff first and then bringing what you come up with your staff to the board is, is the biggest thing. But you just have to figure out what works for you with the number of people that you have. But uh, you gotta pay people something because otherwise you will just lose them, is what I've found. We're, we're nearing the end of the session and I just feel like we need to get a few more questions in, but are you responding to Can I just that? lift something up yeah, from that? Please. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, and I think the idea at least for me personally, uh, family leave is like um, approaching it from a more holistic vision of also just not parenting, but like realizing that we are going through an incredible demographic shift in our country where the workforce is, uh, our parents are getting older and we're getting older and we're gonna need to be taking care of them too. Mm -hmm. So having policies that can be flexible to take care of your kids, your parents, you know, a, a partner, like we need to, have an approach that can work for everything, I think. Could you? Can I? Yes, sir. Sort of jumping on that, though, and I'm just curious really quickly, uh, because we try and do that, right? Our leave program is a, a leave program. It could be maternity, it could be parental care, it could, whatever it is, is what it is. The problem that we're starting to encounter is by expanding it in that way, all of a sudden, I feel like I'm forced to, into a position where I've got to create some limitation mm -hmm. because if we're covering all ends of the spectrum, all of a sudden you have people who will have multiple things as I've had to experience. And it's like, right, but when's the point that I can reasonably say, I'm sorry, I can't cover that one because you already mm -hmm. had one that was over here, you know, <laughs> you had a child and now you have a parental issue. 
does anybody have a sort of successful? So, yeah, I didn't, um, and again, I've never worked in a theater context. Mm -hmm. I currently work for service organizations, so it's different, but I'm just sure there, there are some administrative tasks. So we do have an unlimited leave policy. Mm -hmm. um, it was funny when we had some, we had an employee recently, not recently, a while back, get pregnant, and then she was like, well, does that count too? And I'm like, well, it's unlimited vacation, it's unlimited leave. Um, but we also have about half of our staff is, is remote at least two days a week. Um, and so I've managed people over the last years. Um, some women choose to come back part-time a little bit more, and some people want to take that full-time. And I think um, my, my most recent employee came back after two months um, and just worked remotely. Um, and so I think it's, it's how do you, depending on the size of your organization, use all the tools in your toolbox as a manager to be able to take some of the burden off. Um, so how are you having conversations with, with your colleagues about like what is it that, like what is it that you want? Can you come back a little bit earlier and work remote for two days a week, which allows you not to pay for childcare and still spend time with your kid, but there's at least there's some tasks that you can do from home. Um, and so again, like how are you being creative and flexible and thinking about everything you have as a manager in your toolbox to be able to get people get the work done and create a, a great like work life balance for your employees? Thank you. I think there was one person over here's hand I didn't see. I think it was you, right? So there's a lot of talk in the field about uh, child programs, family forward programs for guest artists. I'm wondering how many of us are offering those same benefits to our resident staff, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so that's a no. <laughs> or is the assumption you live here, you figure, you've figured right. it out, you've got we're grappling neighbors. With it now. Does the orchard make that program a bit? That's for all staff members. That's for staff and our visiting artists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's for staff and visiting artists. Um, the you know what we're trying to just even get the, this is like a good question. The data is just not out there mm -hmm. as to who's doing what, right? That's it's just like you know like let's just really. send you know just that you know it's interesting. We used the graph <coughs> up here. We used a graph from that wonderful Google mm -hmm. spreadsheet of all of the artistic and executive directors. Because it's just so great to have this one massive crowdfunded, you know, crowdsourced piece of data. We should be doing. I think one of the things that I'm just learning so much about various processes here, doing something similar just to understand what you know different size organizations are doing would be very useful for any of us. Wouldn't it be amazing if like you know small organizations obviously are super cost prohibitive to to do some of this, but like if people banded together. To offer like child care for like the region and pooled resources mm -hmm. or something, you know. There, there are there are advocates. We've learned there's advocates that you in places you do not expect them to be, and one of the chief places is your insurance broker. Mm -hmm. oh. um, your insurance brokers are actually, believe it or not, really savvy because they have to deal with so many other, you know, like other organizations. Uh, you know, we're you know, like a lot of theaters in New York, CNS. Does us? They were just purchased by AJ Gallagher, who does the insurance for like the television show Survivor. So they they've got the entire range of crazy uh, <laughs> AJ Gallagher is covering. And if you like, I believe that there's even a product. Like, you name it, they've made a product for it, including one that paces out a you know like is a alternative to the New York State insurance funds uh, and you know workers comp policy and has built into it some form of paid leave coverage in that policy. Mm -hmm. So it paces out, you know, sort of the onus for the organization in a way that isn't as scary uh, budget wise. So we just have a few minutes left. I've already been given the five minute signal. Um, I, I would love to just as a way to, to take us out, um, if a few people who haven't, uh, whose voices we haven't heard yet, um, could actually just uh, reflect on something you're taking away from this session. We can popcorn, we can keep it really brief, but just something that you're taking away that will help us think about the trajectory of the session and, and it's hopefully practicality. I think the searching for re searching for resources, like hearing hearing how many resources are out there to access, which feels a little overwhelming right now, but probably isn't when you get something that happens. Great. Thank you. Anyone else something you're taking away? Yes, please. I just feel like we're so on the edge of figuring out childcare mm -hmm. for the masses. We're mm -hmm. right there. <laughs> and it's possible. We just have to finish that. I want to share something that um, Erin Washington said in the session we were co-facilitating yesterday. She said, 
when she first moved into an apartment and before she had sort of furniture and stuff like that, she put signs on the wall. She was like, sofa, TV. Uh, and, 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 and sort of one by one, those things sort of came in. And I do, I do sort of feel like, also to quote Amelia Cacciaparo, I feel like it's head of, head of a penny, for those of you who've heard that story, like that if, if enough minds are thinking in that direction and if we hold the space for that thing, um, then I think you're right. I think that that, that creativity will fill that, that void. A couple, yes, please. I think there are so many important issues uh, that have come up in this that I want to encourage TCG to do longer than an hour and a half because you could have a whole day on some of these topics and there's just not enough time spent on important HR issues. Well, if somebody to wants to initiate this being put forth as an open, as one of the open topics, mm -hmm. it could certainly I'll be. Do that. Uh, yeah. 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 Right, great. so tomorrow there's, tomorrow there's open space, so you can go onto the app, I believe it is, and um, actually uh, hold uh, hold a breakout session about that. Um, you have yes, to get it in by five. Oh, get it in by five. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Yes, please. I just wanted to say out loud that I, I know for me it has been, and for, for colleagues, uh, the conference itself, if it found a way to offer child care, even mm -hmm. something that's mm -hmm. paid, would open it up to many, many more people mm -hmm. being able to come to the conference. Annabella, is that something you can report back, child care for the conference? Absolutely. Um, and I also just want to encourage folks to, in your notes, when you're reviewing the session uh -huh. on the app, please let us know, you know, about extended time, having more space. Yes, that is that is a thing also. Please take a moment after the, the and rate the session. And, and rate and, the session. And rate the mm -hmm. session, and yes, all of that. Um, it's what, that what, we spend this much time thinking about like basic life stuff. Mm -hmm. I know. Like, our country it is. is so hostile. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. just trying to be someone living and raising a regular ass life. Yeah. One, one last takeaway, someone we haven't heard from yet? Yes, please. I think it's just really interesting. I'm someone new in my career and decided to come here to like hear what hear what everyone, you know, is doing and and you know, when you think about like where you want your career to be and where you are in life. Like I don't have children but I think a lot about where I will be and how that would be possible. So it's really nice to hear what everyone's doing in their respective theaters. Thank you so much. Uh, again, thanks to our four people for sparking off the conversation. Mm -hmm. And before we, before we go back to the fray of the conference, um, out of this lovely intimate space, thank you, for it served for uh, your, your setting off the suggestion that we stay as a large group. Can we just take another breath together, please? such an exquisite moment when we all sit in silence like that. Thank you so much. Guys, if anybody's interested in the umbrella program, I can just